first timothy chapter 6 verse 16 the bible says god dwells in light unapproachable so there's a realm where only god can enter that's where the oracles of god are kept and so when we read genesis 1:26, that is the studio god went back into and he, and the godhead was communing with himself so the father spoke to the son and the son spoke to the spirit and the spirit spoke to the father the community of the godhead entered the dialogue and they said let us make man now if they created man in the image of the son he would have had the ranking required to rule the earth if they created man in the image of the spirit he would have had the authority to rule the earth if man was created in the image of the father he would have had the authority to rule the earth but the creature that god wanted to bring on the scene is one that carries the reality of the son the spirit and the father so that when you see this new being he will image the godhead he said let us make man not in the image of the son not in the image of the spirit not in the image of the father in our own image after our likeness so a creature appeared that embodied the fullness of god because god wanted earth to be the mirror image of heaven you know the angels were contemplating and the prophet picked it in Psalm 8 verse 4. He said, what is man? He didn't say, who is man? Because the being he's looking into is as deep as God. Because the essence of God is trapped for the first time in a visible entity. There was nothing that could contain God. Even heaven can't contain God. The Bible said, heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. There was nothing that could contain the totality of God. For the first time, a creature was made that could contain the totality of God. So there was a dialogue. What is this being that you are mindful of him? What is this creature? What are his dimensions? He said, you made him a little lower than the Elohim. So in the ranking of God, only the Elohim was superior to this creature. Because he said, you crowned him with glory and honor. So what is in God was what he put in the man. Does it not surprise you that the first time God wanted to make himself visible, he didn't take the image of Michael the archangel. He didn't take the image of Gabriel. He took the image of man. Because man is the only entity that can contain God. Because man was created to bring God's government to the visible realm. And so when the Lucifer saw this, he was perturbed. Because if I'm dealing with archangels, I can contend with them because myself, I'm an archangel. But now a creature has come on the scene that is exactly like God. Now we have to truncate his, his program because if he is completed, he will rule among the spirit realm. And so that was why Lucifer brought rebellion into the garden. Because the way God decided to create man was first to create an earthly casing that will contain the real man. Because the real man did not come from anything visible. The real man came from inside God. There's no raw material for creating this being. You can't create a being with any raw material that can be like God. So the Bible said, man came from the breath of God. So the raw material for creating the man is God himself. If you want to find the raw material with which man was created, it was God. That was why in Genesis 1:26, when he said, let us make man in our own image. The word used for creation there is the word bara. It means to be made from nothing. And if you go to Genesis 2, 7, God gathered the dust from the ground. And this bara, this being that came from inside God, God breathed him into the nostril of the dust and the being was hid in dust. Why do you think God hid man in dust? Because the man carries the glory of God. If he allows him to move, they will worship him. So God decided to hide him inside dust so that the glory can be hid. Oh. When Lucifer saw what God was coupling, the architecture, the engineering that God was putting together, he knew that an ancient being was about to appear. And so he didn't allow the process complete because what would have seen the, the process of man's creation was for him to eat of the tree of life. That's what would have animated the God dimension out of him. So Lucifer truncated the process. I will not let this process be completed. And so he taught the man the same rebellion that he practiced that he was rejected. But you know, God is wiser because God knows that this thing will happen. Because of that, even the process of recreating man was no longer going back to dust. That's why God created biology. So that men can come from the womb. And it was an intervention program. When this man falls, I can enter the womb of a virgin and come as a man so that I can reprogram him. Because this man will need reprogramming. <laughs> ah, this man is going to need to be reprogrammed. So I can't create him as a spirit. 
I must create him as a flesh so that when he falls I will become man because this man is like God so God can be like man so he said great is the mystery of godliness that God became flesh when I become man I will reprogram this man and put him on the earth again so man from day one was created to live and function like God the problem the man had always had is not about who he is it's about his inability to function in the fullness of his reality in the garden the process was truncated now that we have been reprogrammed in Christ the Holy Ghost has been put in us to help us complete that process but we still cannot because Satan keeps fighting us from entering our fullness and so when you study God's program on the earth it is threefold number one is to win the fallen man by giving him life number two is to through the Holy Ghost and the world disciple the fallen man so that he can grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ and number three so that the fallen man can go into all the wars and disciple all nations that was the program in Genesis 1 that is still the program today revival is not just for sinners revival is actually for those who are born again because it's an empowerment that brings transformation it's an empowerment that brings intimacy and it's an empowerment that causes us to function at the frequency of Christ if you are a Christian and you are not living and operating like Christ then you need revival because revival is a dimension of the quickening spirit which is an operation of the spirit of Christ but you see revival is not cheap there are precursors to revival and so anybody who wants to grow to function by Christ there are requisite requirements for him to be at that level this is why not too many people can stay revival because they are not willing to pay the price although the spirit of Christ is on your inside but there are corporations they will require from you for it to be effective in your life it is your cooperating with the spirit of Christ that will stir revival and there are requirements for that spirit to be able to trigger revival through you number one is brokenness sincere brokenness and repentance listen you are not yet quickened by the spirit of Christ if you are still full of yourself if you think you can do what you can do without God no matter how successful you are you are a failure because in the realm of God if it is not by God then the signature of God is not on it this is why until a generation becomes broken and repent there can be no genuine revival and if there's no genuine revival it means the spirit of Christ is not at work the quickening spirit has been suspended hope you know we can deaden the operation of the spirit and so if we want to see revival then brokenness and genuine repentance repentance must come again in second Chronicles 7 14 he said if my people who are called by my name these are not sinners these are people who are born of God but they have seen the necessity of the quickening spirit and I will take time to show you some things Jesus did to let you know we have not started. See, when we talk revival, we are talking a dimension of power that the world has not seen. You can stop any event and draw attention to God if revival happens. He was teaching a multitude for three days and everybody was famished. There was no food. He said, give them something to eat. Those who operated at the senses, sense level, say, sir, please you have good respect you have reputation don't ruin it today there's no way these people can be fed even a year's wages can't suffice and if if we let them go they will faint on the road meaning they were desperately hungry what do you have he said there's nothing but since you insist there's a lad here with five loaves and two fish bring it you if you were there what will you be thinking what, what do you do with five loaves and two fish among these people there are five thousand men no counting women and children and he brought it gave thanks take give them if you collected that bread i assure you you will give the young boy his bread back and say please take I i'm not an, i'm not callous go and eat your food i don't want to deny you your meal but as they broke it he multiplied the miracle happened in their hand because this is a dimension where you can never be stranded you can never be stranded a man goes to a wedding feast unprepared and they told him the wine is out mother with all due respect i don't run a manif a wine factory i'm not a brew i don't brew wine what, what what do you mean the wine is out and the woman looks at him and says, whatever he tells you to do 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 they brew wine by talking 
you need a whole system working together a whole factory to generate one what do you mean whatsoever he tells you to do yet he was not taken on words. he looked around him anything can become a weapon and he saw six jars he said fill them with water himself knew it was water because he called it what it was and they filled them with water and when they were done filling them he didn't pray he said fetch it at least you would have tasted he didn't taste he said take it to the governor of the feast why not start with the servant so that if it doesn't work at least it can be corrected in the realm of the spirit of christ there can be no error precision is 100 percent and they took it to the governor of the feast and the governor exclaimed others give the best wine at the beginning but you kept the best for the last so without prayer without talking without premeditating every command gave the best result a whole wedding was stopped jesus didn't even matter to come out the bible said this be the first miracle of jesus and there he began to manifest his glory if the world can't see the glory of god it means we need revival they left him took the boat and went the bible said at the third watch that is nine hours later they saw him walking on water even if you can walk on water which is not reasonable how can you catch up with a boat that left hours ago that means he was actually gliding and when they saw him they screamed if he is a ghost he's a ghost he said no see there is a realm see you know that when the man was created there's a spirit in the man there's a soul in the man there's a body in the man you know what that means when men are operating operate with them but when men fail don't join them rise up there's a higher realm on your inside the spirit realm is also there man can use boat there's nothing wrong in using boat use boat when you need to use cars when you need to use a plane when you need to but if there is no plane if there's no car if there's no boat refuse to be stranded because there is another dimension to you he said fear not it is i and peter told him if it is thou bid me come and jesus told him come this is not a reality exclusive to me anybody in my order can manifest it and peter also began to walk on water to show you that there is a realm we have not seen there's a dimension we have not seen and two men were walking on water violating the law of flotation violating everything that is rational to human thinking jesus shows up at the tomb of lazarus everybody was offended we told you when this man was sick when something could be done you refused to come now he's dead now he's buried now he's decayed now he's smelling why are you coming now and it's a realm where time has no authority there's no such thing as too late where i come from i operate from eternity i control that dimension he said where have you kept him and he marches with audacity to the tomb without rehearsal he looks at them he said roll away the stone you you don't see when we talk revival people don't know what we are saying do you know how silly it looks for a man to approach a tomb of a person buried four days ago they rushed to him those who sincerely loved him and told him master by now this man is smelling it's an unreasonable thing you're about to do he said have i not told you if thou wouldest believe thou shouldest see the glory of god you are living in a realm where you see glory at will and they rolled the stone away and he shouted lazarus come forth the bible says, he that was dead came back to life and he didn't just wake up the force of what he said carried the man that was embalmed and put him at the door he said lucy let him go and then such a man looks at you and tells you the work that i do you shall do also and greater work than you do and then you tell me we don't need revival as dependent and as weak as we are you say we don't need revival there's no food at home we are hopeless meanwhile somebody who multiplied five loaves and two fish two us we can do the same and you say we don't need revival somebody who goes to a tomb where somebody was dead calls him back to life tells you you will do the same are we not supposed to be weeping the normal life is a cause because we came from an ancestry there is a heritage that we have we are a people of signs and of wonders the bible said in romans 15:4, the things that were written are for time they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope there is a heritage that we came from and this is not for preachers the bible said women receive their dead back to life 
it's not just about jesus it's about everybody that belongs to this lineage there is something on our inside that must be activated and so if you have seen these things and you know that the life we are living is not what jesus expects then it's time to humble ourselves i know you have a phd i know you work in an oil company i know you own a bank but listen there are realms that we have not seen and so he says, if my people who are called by my name if they will humble themselves because when you see what jesus did and when you see what he expects you to do it will humble you he said if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face he said and turn from their wicked ways i will hear them from heaven i will forgive them and i will heed their land there's an outpouring that must happen in acts of the apostles chapter 3 verse 19 he said times of refreshing comes on the presence of the lord but it's for those who will humble themselves and turn in repentance we want to see revival. We want to see a generation where people who carry graces for wonders, un unexplainable but undeniable realities. That's what we are crying for. Number two trigger for revival is prayer. A generation that does not pray is an arrogant generation. Because when you don't pray, you are telling God, I have it, I have it covered. I know what to do, I can handle it myself. But honestly, if you depend on God and you need God to be what God wants you to be, then prayer will become your life. Look at the apostles. They walked with Jesus for three years, some three and a half years. He told them, don't run out of lecture notes. You are going to meet princes. You are going to meet principalities, custodians of darkness. If you step out with lecture notes, you are in trouble. In Luke 24, 49, he said, tarry until you are endured with power from on high. So the key for the supply of the spirit is to tarry. And true to his word, the Bible told us in Acts 2 from verse 1, he said they were together in one accord. In the place of prayer, suddenly they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And the place where they were was filled with the spirit and cloven tongues as of fire appeared on our head. Listen, these things are told us to let us know that it can happen with anyone. If we humble ourselves in brokenness, we can carry the same dimension. If we humble ourselves in prayer, we can carry the same dimension suddenly men who were in fear men who were the almost the de de delayed from their course of life something comes upon them they open the door and step out with audacity and began to talk with authority where did they learn it from there are dimensions that cannot be learned they are caught that's why you must pray until he rest upon you they say ask of him rain in the time of the latter rain and it shall cause bright clouds he will cause those clouds and he said there shall be rain on every blade of grass this is a heritage not for apostles not for prophets not for evangelists pastors and teachers for everyone who is numbered in the assembly when the spirit fell upon them it fell upon everybody in the house but they needed to have prayed before it happened we are tired of prayer and that's why the supernatural has been withdrawn from us if we want to see revival, we must go back to the altar. That's what the, the first apostles did. That's what the first church did. And that's what we must do. A people that pray like they breathe must rise. It's not the religion of coming for prayer meeting for two hours. What you are looking for comes from the high heavens. Two hours prayer meeting can't work. You must become a man of prayer. You must talk prayer, breathe prayer, and live prayer. And when the fire falls, everybody will know that you are not the same. Because when revival happens, there are indicators. Prayer. Number three, trigger of this outpouring. The word of God must be preached in its pure form. A people who are not interested in politics or gimmicks, but who will speak the word in truth and in verity, must rise if the outpouring will take place. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, Peter went to the house of somebody who was not even qualified to be part of the commonwealth of Israel. But the Bible said, while Peter yet speak, he said the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And the apostles of old knew this. So everywhere they went, they saturated it with the word of God. In Acts 19 verse 20, the Bible said in Ephesus, he said so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. There was a time they accused them of filling Jerusalem with their doctrine. This is a generation where Christians are more interested in propagating comedy. We are interested in propagating dress. We are interested in propagating car. And a generation is starving of truth. And we think there will be revival. 
All of us seated here have handles. Go and check our platform. See the things we are giving to the world. Hairstyle, dress code, cars, birthdays, comedy skit. That's what we are saturating. And we don't know that what we release creates an energy in the atmosphere. We release things that principalities trade with to darken atmosphere. That's why you go to certain places now. You can't pray. It's saturated with pornography. Somebody says it's dancing. And every move is, is pornography on display. And Christians share it. They organize a show, a pornographic show on national television. Call it Big Brother Niger. Christians watch. Christians share. And we think there will be revival. We have locked the atmosphere with darkness. Meanwhile, in the days of the apostles, everybody was a preacher of the world. They preached it, they talked it. Even when persecution scatters them, anybody that moved, move with the world. They said, Philip went to Samaria. This was a, an usher. He didn't need any ceremony of, of commissioning. Persecution has brought him to Samaria. There was one thing they knew to do. He preached Christ there. And the whole city was full of joy. He preached Christ there. He preached Christ. Who told us that preaching is for the fivefold ministry? The Bible said God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses against them. He gave them the word of reconciliation. How many Christians preach in their offices? But go and meet the sons of the bond woman. You can have a meeting with them when it is time for prayer. They will tell you, excuse me, I need to pray. And they owe you no apology. And the world respects them. Even in the western world today, they can kneel down on the road and they are praying. But a Christian is too diplomatic. He's too learned, he's too civilized, he's too educated. And we allow the atmospheres that we should get keep to be taken over by darkness. And we don't know we are the sort of the earth. If we fail in our duty, the earth will be overrun by darkness. How come in our generation, everybody who is sick is directed to the hospital? I'm not against medical science. But what has happened to the days of the apostles? Where they are praying, the whole city is waiting for them outside. The Bible said the multitude gathered. Acts chapter 5 from verse 12 to 15. Multitudes gathered. Even the ones who couldn't enter the temple. Waiting for those who are praying to come out. So when somebody has an emergency, they take him to church. And the Bible said they, those who could not be prayed for, they waited for the shadow of Peter. The shadow. So the population was too much. There's no time to lay hands. So they had to line them on the street for the shadow of Peter to touch them. And the Bible said, as many as were touched were healed. So the same thing Jesus was doing, they modeled it. Because in Matthew chapter 8, verse 15, 16, and 17, the Bible said, when the evening was come, they brought the sick from every city, waiting for Jesus. And they said, he rebuked spirit by his words, and he healed the sick. The same thing happened with the apostles. Why has he stopped with us? He said, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from the body of Paul and it healed the sick. They said when Philip went to Samaria, he didn't just preach Christ. He cast out devils. He healed those who were sick of the palsy. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. So it was a normal thing in the assembly. What has happened to our own generation? When people need counsel, they were supposed to go to church. He said in the last days, Isaiah 2 verse 2, the house of God shall be upon the mountains of God. He said, men of all nations shall say, let us go to the house of God. He said that he may teach us his ways. Out of Zion proceed the Lord. He will teach us how come the world is not coming to be taught. What has happened to the wisdom of the just? When they didn't have the Holy Ghost living on their inside, the Bible said the sons of Isaac, they had understanding of times and season and knew what Israel ought to do. We have the Holy Ghost now. We don't have counsel. Rather, we are the ones seeking counsel. How can we sleep? If the spirit of Christ begins to quicken you, there will be a renewed appetite for the supernatural. You will just realize that you are the answer to the world. You are not part of the problem. You are the answer. But for you to be the answer, a dimension of wisdom and power must issue out of you. We are talking about the quickening spirit. When it comes upon you, it shows. When it comes upon you, when it is activated, it shows. It shows there will be brokenness. There will be passion for prayer. There will be passion for the world. It shows. And when this thing begins to happen to us, know that the move of God is imminent. A point comes when you become tired of status quo. 
the bible spoke about gideon these are old testament saints who didn't have the holy ghost on their inside yet they had sufficient body to become restless gideon sat down lamenting and all his contemplation is where is the god of our fathers that did all the miracles we heard of because when they checked what was and what is they are worlds apart so they lost their sleep this is why we should not sleep in the days when we should weep renewed desire renewed appetite for hunger where's the god of paul where's the god of peter where's the god of daniel where's the god that gave men so much wisdom that king marveled at them sometimes when i read the bible i just close it and i lose appetite the bible spoke concerning daniel this man did not have the holy ghost living on his inside a king had a dream and called all the wise men and when they say wise men don't make the mistake of thinking they are people who read books in those days wise men are people who hear spirits and they can give counsel based on what spirits tell them it's beyond reading books so the wise men daniel was dealing with were sorcerers they were astrologers they were witches the same people we see today and run away those were the people daniel sat in class with and was competing with them and the bible said they were 10 times better witches and wizards astrologers those were the men they were dealing with and when the king saw them he said i won't tell you the dream because you can always manufacture interpretation you tell me what i dreamt and they told the king what you have asked for is a difficult matter it dwells only among the gods and daniel looked at the king and said give us time we know where the gods are and as if it was a joke few days later he showed up because the bible said there was the dream revealed to daniel in a night vision and he came imagine what how the king would be looking when daniel was telling him this is the dream you had when you went to sleep around 10 04 <laughs> when daniel finished the king will need and say pray for me you are actually the king of this land these were the things our fathers did how come we are like this if the spirit of christ begins to quicken us there will be a renewed appetite for the supernatural because none of us was created to live a, med a mediocre life they say christ in you is the hope of glory that means there is a hope for you to walk in glory but this is the protocol for the activation of that glory appetite for the supernatural if god sent us to go and cast out devils how can somebody in our family be demonized if god sent us to go and heal the sick in the world how can people in our family die of sickness and all of us from father to sister to nephew to niece we are all in the hospital praying and hoping for the doctor to get the right drug and diagnosis thank god for doctors but our hope is not in doctors there is something we carry that the world is waiting for we are the healing of the nations and so we need a renewed hunger for the supernatural a renewed hunger number five is unity and oneness in the spirit a point has come for every one of us to see ourselves as members of one body the way the devil disarms us is that he makes us think we are enemies and competing with one another we are not here to compete with ourselves we are here to complement ourselves if one is seen the other should heal and if the other is healing the other should walk in wisdom and if the other is walking in wisdom the other should rule in governmental power so anything any other person has is part of the arrow in the quiver there should be no room for envy because it is in the context of unity and oneness that the holy ghost falls that the revival spirit finds expression in acts 2 verse 1 he said they were together in one accord so they knew the trigger jesus told them first in luke 24 49 gather together they needed an auditorium to meet but a point come they came they went beyond auditorium they became connected in spirit so they left gathering together to moving into one accord and they didn't stop there in acts 2 46 the bible said they came into singleness of heart so that was a point where you couldn't distinguish who was Igbo or who was Hausa or who was Yoruba. Everybody became one in spirit and in truth. When you are like that, the Holy Ghost cannot but fall. When you are like that, revival cannot but happen. But the devil comes, puff up us with the little that we have. And we want to be individual giants. That you heal the sick, is that all there is in God? That you are in government, is that all there is in God? That you are financially stable, is that all there is in God? The guy who has money may need an intercessor. The guy who prays may need the healing evangelist. The guy who works in healing may need finances. We are one body in Christ.
anything that deceives us to be separated has robbed us of revival. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The day has come when we must look at ourselves and know that we are not just brothers and sisters, but we are one body. The person sitting by your left is like your ear. The one sitting by your right is like your right arm. That is how one we are. In fact, our connection in the spirit is deeper than our connection in blood. Because blood connection ends in time. Connection in the spirit continues to eternity. But a generation that does not know unity will never see revival. And finally, when the quickening spirit begins to walk in you, you become a sacrifice. You become sold out to God. Because that's what it will demand of you. It will demand you to submit and submit to God completely. Because if you don't make yourself the sacrifice, the fire will never fall. In Leviticus 9, 22 to 24, the moment the sacrifice is put on the altar, the fire falls from heaven. The fire is sensitive only to the sacrifice. And that's why Paul told us in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you dearly beloved, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This selfish generation will never see revival. Because everybody is thinking about me and my family. It's about myself, my family, and I. Everything is about us. But revival begins when we move from I to our. Our Father, who art in heaven. There's a place where the prayer must be corporate. The expectation must be corporate. That's when the Holy Ghost falls. And trust me, when these kind of things begin to happen, nobody will have a deficiency. In the early church, Acts 4.34, the Bible said those who were possessors of land sold them, brought the, the proceeds to the apostles' feet. It said even distribution was made. There was none amongst them that lack. When you become selfless, you can never lack. You are rather insured to a point where nothing is able to bring you down. When God begins to see these indicators, it's a sign that the quickening spirit is at work on our inside. And this operation is what triggers the move of the Holy Ghost. Because if the move of the Holy Ghost does not happen, we will never come to that level of maturity where we can handle the dimensions of God. We can't win this world if there's no move of the Spirit. Thank God for the outreaches we have, but a point must come where whole cities need to come and hear us. Because the harvest must grow in a geometric dimension. If it doesn't grow like that, there will be challenge. Number four, when revival takes place, there is reformation in society. Because the people who go into position in society becomes God-fearing people. And the Bible said, if the righteous rule, it said the people rejoice. This is why we need revival. So that our senators too will carry fire. Our governors will carry fire. Our presidents will carry fire. And when these things begin to happen, you will see that they will start instituting the ordinances of God in territories. Most of the things we suffer were created by human greed and wickedness including poverty when these things when revival happen these things will begin to vanish because there will be equity there will be justice there will be compassion there will be kindness there will be fairness and you will see that society will also begin to improve this is why we cannot sleep because what we are talking about here is beyond us experiencing god it has an impact even in our society and so god gave us this power to affect society and to affect our generation but we must comply and align with the quickening spirit. And you know the good news? That quickening spirit is at work in every one of us. The Bible said in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, it says you are not in the flesh. It says you are in the spirit. If it be that the spirit of Christ is in you. It says you are in the spirit. You are in the spirit. It says if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, it says he's none of his. So the, that you are here and that you confess Jesus as Lord, it means that quickening spirit is already on your inside. What you need to do is to open yourself up to transformation. And tell the Lord, I am ready. I am ready for you to move through me. I am ready for you to use me. I am ready for you to make me an agent and an agency of revival. Can I tell you something? Nobody God used for revival. Prepared for it. It was God himself that invited them. Peter, James and John were fishing. It was Jesus that invited them. Follow me, I will make you. Paul was on his way to Damascus to destroy the church. It was Jesus that invited him. So, so, why persecutest thou me? So everyone you see God using mightily, God was the one who intercepted them. Now, if God will intercept those who were doing their business, how about you who came to church to seek him? If you will open your heart and say, Lord, I'm available for revival. I'm available for your spirit to ride through me and 
create a change in my generation. I'm available for your spirit to activate the possibilities of Christ in me so that I become an answer to my generation. You will marvel what God will do through you. You will marvel. But you see, when you ask that spirit to, that spirit will break you. When time comes for brokenness, hope you will comply. When you ask that spirit to, he will invite you to the altar because you must pray. When you ask that spirit to, he will stir an appetite for the world. That means a point will come when you and the Bible become friends. You will sit on messages and hear the word of God. When you ask that spirit to, he will trigger hunger in your spirit for supernatural things. This is the implication of asking that spirit. Tonight, I came to lay a foundation. A generation that sincerely want God to use them must rise. And I don't know who is seated here tonight, who is part of that crying generation that say, Lord, if there will be a revival in Africa, put me at the forefront. Lord, if there will be a revival in the world, put me at the forefront. Lord, if there will be a revival in this generation, put me at the forefront. Listen, Christ can be asleep on your inside. They were in the boat and Jesus was there, but he was sleeping. And you know the implication, if Christ is sleeping in your inside, you may sink. Unless you tap him and say, wake up Lord, carest not thou that we perish. That's why urgency is required. There are most of us who have carried Jesus for 20 years, but he has been sleeping. Some of us have carried Jesus for 10 years. He has been sleeping. We take pride in telling people when we gave our heart to Christ. That's not the testimony the world wants to hear. Since you gave your heart to Christ, what has Christ done through you? Since you gave your heart to Christ, how much of Christ has been seen through you? That is what heaven is interested in. And that is why we need the spirit of revival. Can we lift our hands toward heaven as a sign of surrender? And ask that, that spirit to take over tonight. Ah. My God, my God, if 